Welcome to video five for week one. In this video, I wanna finish off a couple of topics to do with iterated in integrals and definite integrals. First, I wanna talk about improper integrals. In single variable calculus, we used improper integrals. We had things that were undefined at the edge of the interval or domains that extended to infinity, and the same thing works here. So let's say I have a function which is defined on the interval zero, one, cross zero, one to r, and I've taken very intentionally open intervals on this side because I want to deal with potential problems of diverging to infinity. So the iterated integral is set up this way. I integrate from 0 to 1 in both variables. Say I'm doing the y inside and the x outside. So let's say this function has the property that as x approaches 0, the function diverges to infinity, say regardless of what y is. So that means that in the outside integral, in the x integral, I can't just evaluate at 0. But since the iterated integral just boils this down to two consecutive single variable integrals, I can do the improper integral just in that variable. So I can still do this inside integral in y. The fact that there's an x in here is fine because in the domain here, I'm never actually reaching zero. I'm not choosing the closed interval. And even if I did choose the closed interval, what happens on the edge doesn't necessarily affect this. This is some constant x. It's not really even determined as far as the y integral goes. So I can still do this inside piece, and then when I get to this outside piece, I do the same trick I did for improper integrals of a single variable, is I take a limit approaching the problematic uh, place where the function diverges and see what happens to the integral. Is the integral going to diverge, or is the integral going to converge in that limit? If the problem was with y's, if the function diverged as y approached zero, then since y is the inside integral, I would in fact have that limit inside here. I would change the bound in y from zero to a and take the limit as we approach zero from the positive side. So this limit can show up in the outside integral or in the inside integral, whatever the case is. But once I've done it in the inside integral, I've sort of dealt with this problem um, if it converges or if it doesn't converge, then I've got an infinity there and I have to stop. So it really does boil to, down to doing single variable improper integrals. You just have to figure out where the problems on your boundary are. And if they're on multiple boundaries, you might need to have a limit on both. One thing this can also do is this can let us integrate over unbounded intervals, unbounded domains. So say I want to integrate over the entire plane R2. So I had some function here, and I want to say, well, what's the volume under this entire function spreading out over the entire plane? What I can do is I can take the interval from negative a, a and negative b to b, so that's sort of an interval settled at the origin, and I take the limit as both of these things go out. So I have the origin here, I have from negative a to a here, I have from negative b to b here, and the limit in the x-coordinate is pushing the a out, the limit in the y-coordinate is pushing the b out, and in these two limits I will end up getting the entire plane, but this is still an integral over an interval, which is a thing that I have defined. Those are the only integrals I know how to do so far. I've only defined integrals over intervals, finite intervals. And then if I turn this into an iterated integral, well, this b applies to this, so this limit as b goes to infinity is going to apply to the inside dy piece, and this limit as a goes to infinity is going to apply to the outside dx piece. And that would be switched if I had done it dx dy instead of dy dx. Again, always moving inside to outside. Let me do an example. I have this function, which is undefined at the origin. So if I define on this open interval, this is a valid domain for this function. But at 0, 0, I get division by 0. So let me try and do this as an iterated integral. So I'm going to go from 0 to 1 and 0 to 1 in both variables. I'll do the x inside and the y outside. Here, I can actually do the inside variable just fine because this y is actually never zero in the domain. So even if x is going to zero, I still have plus a positive number, and this is a positive number here. So I can actually do this inside integral in x without having to worry about improper integrals and limits because of that y coordinate. But then when I get to here, here I have this y squared of the denominator. Um, I've skipped the steps of the antiderivatives. I think I looked them up from by, by computer for this particular function. But here I have a y squared, so here I actually have to take an improper integral with this limit because this will be undefined at y equals zero. I take the limit. Uh, this is the antiderivative that I get. I evaluate it on the limit. And as I 
This part is just fine. That's the evaluation one. And the evaluation is A is A goes to zero positive. Uh, this is going to be one. It's going to be divided by a very small positive number. This is going to diverge to infinity. So the volume under this particular function over this interval as we approach this corner where it shoots up to infinity is in fact infinite. And like improper integrals of a single variable, that could be finite, that could be infinite when I have this sort of asymptotic behavior where near a particular point my function shoots up to infinity. It depends how fast it shoots up. It might, it might shrink down very, very quickly such that even though it's an infinitely tall spike, it only encloses a finite volume. And it might be slower and it might be a wider spike and it might enclose an infinite volume. You really don't know until you take the limits. One last idea I want to cover in this particular video is the idea of separable functions. This is not terribly deep. This is just sort of a nice thing to point out. I haven't even done any examples with it. But if I have a function of two variables that can be expressed as the product of a function of each variable, I call that a separable function. Uh, this was the same thing that we did for separable differential equations. If I had this differential equation and this side split up this way as g of x times h of y, I called that a separable differential equation. So this use of the term separable is in fact exactly the same as the term that we had for differential equations. If I try and integrate a separable function, then what happens is I can actually move the x pieces out of the y integral and move the y pieces out of the x integral. So that when I do this, this thing doesn't involve any x's, so it can just sort of pop out here or pop out here, what direction I, I intend to move it. And I get, in fact, the multiplication of two completely independent integrals. I don't even need to have one inside the other. I can just split them up and multiply the two results together. Again, that's not terribly deep, but it's sort of a nice calculation thing So when you see functions that have this form. If you want to just set it up as the two independent integrals and multiply them together, you are welcome to do so.